Hello and welcome to the Figure Preparation and Image Editing Workshop. I'm Curtis Glavin from the Pediatric Oncology Department at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. This is the second of three sessions on figure preparation and image editing for grant applications and journal publications. The first session covered concepts and tools related to image editing. In this session, we'll cover common workflows. And in the third and final session, we'll be covering advanced image editing techniques. It is important to note that these sessions are designed to provide information about image editing for grant applications, digital presentations, and journal publications. These sessions are not intended to cover techniques and tools that should be used when processing images for scientific analysis. However, many of the concepts and tools covered in this workshop are relevant to image processing for analysis and should serve as a good introduction for those looking to do more advanced image analysis work. We'll start by looking at a few concepts, beginning with bitmap image print size. The print size of a bitmap image is determined by three factors. The dots per inch, or DPI ratio, for the image. The total number of pixels in the horizontal dimension for the image. And the total number of pixels in the vertical dimension for the image. The print width of a bitmap image can be calculated by dividing the number of pixels in the horizontal dimension of the image by the DPI ratio for the image. The print height of a bitmap image can be calculated by dividing the number of pixels in the vertical dimension of the image by the DPI ratio for the image. Let's look at some examples. Assume we have a 20 pixel wide by 10 pixel tall image. Note that when specifying two-dimensional image dimensions, width is usually indicated first, followed by height. Let's also assume that this image has a ratio of 200 dpi. This image would have 20 times 10, or 200, total pixels. Note here that the total number of pixels in the image is relatively low. 200 total pixels is far, far fewer pixels than the number of pixels that would be in an image captured by a typical mobile phone camera, for example. However, the DPI of this image is higher, for example, than the number of dots per inch on a typical desktop computer monitor. Calculating the print width of the image, if we divide 20 pixels by 200 DPI, we see that the print width of this image would be 0.1 inches. Calculating the print height of the image, if we divide 10 pixels by 200 dpi, we see that the print height of this image would be 0.05 inches. Let's look at another example. Imagine that we have a bitmap image that is 2,000 pixels wide by 1,000 pixels tall at 10 dpi. This bitmap would have 2 million total pixels, which is many, many more than our first image. However, this image has a significantly smaller DPI at 10 DPI versus the first example's 200 DPI. Calculating the print width of the image, if we divide 2,000 pixels by 10 DPI, we see that the print width of this image would be 200 inches. Calculating the print height of the image, if we divide 1,000 pixels by 10 dpi, we see that the print height of this image would be 100 inches. It's possible to set the dpi for any image as large or small as desired, regardless of the number of pixels in the image. Let's look at another concept that's important when manipulating bitmap images, which is downsampling. Downsampling reduces the number of pixels in a bitmap image. There are many different methods for downsampling a bitmap image. Higher quality downsampling methods use data from multiple adjacent pixels in a source bitmap image to generate each pixel in a new bitmap image with fewer total pixels. Assume that we have a small bitmap image that is 3 pixels wide by 3 pixels tall. If we wanted to downsample this bitmap image to a 1 pixel bitmap, we could simply discard all 8 pixels surrounding the center pixel. 
This, however, would be a low quality downsampling method, since the new one pixel bitmap would not incorporate any of the data from eight of the nine pixels in the original image. The new downsampled bitmap would not be a good representation of the original bitmap. Let's look at a different method for downsampling. Imagine that we have the original 3 pixel by 3 pixel bitmap. To generate a 1 pixel bitmap, we could take a weighted average of the colors of all 9 pixels in the original bitmap and create a new 1 pixel bitmap whose pixel color is that average color value. This would be a higher quality downsampling method. All downsampling is destructive editing as it changes the data in the original image. It is important not to use downsampling inappropriately. However, downsampling can be useful, for example, in reducing the amount of noise in a bitmap image. Sticking with our one pixel bitmap image, let's look at upscaling. Upscaling increases the number of pixels in an image. Imagine that we have the same one pixel bitmap image that we just generated through downsampling, and we want to generate a three pixel by three pixel bitmap. We could do this by creating eight surrounding pixels with color values that are based on the original single pixel. We could perhaps use a formula that would assign the new corner pixels in the three pixel by three pixel image slightly different colors than the pixels that are directly above, below, and beside the original pixel since the centers of the corner pixels would be farther away from the center of the original single pixel than the centers of the directly adjacent pixels. Notice, however, that we cannot get back the colors from the original 3x3 three three bitmap. It is important to never upscale bitmap images. Doing so can both invent and distort image data and never yields any quality improvement. With all this, plus the concepts we covered in the first session in mind, let's consider a few questions. Assume that we are comparing two image files of the same subject. Consider for yourself, is it always the case that the image file with more pixels is a better image of the subject than the image file with fewer pixels? The image file with higher DPI is better than the image file with lower DPI. If one of the image files is a JPEG and the other is a TIFF, the TIFF version is better than the JPEG version. If one of the files is a PDF and the other is a JPEG, the text in the PDF will be sharper than the text in the JPEG. Given the keyword always in the question, the answer to all of these is no, since there are cases where each of these is false. Keep in mind all of these questions as we move through the rest of this session. We'll be looking at some workflows for creating and editing images and figures. At several points, we'll compare the wrong way of doing things with the right way. I'll intentionally do things the wrong way to demonstrate why the answers to all of these questions is no. These mistakes will demonstrate common problems that can arise when manipulating image data. I'll indicate when I'm doing things the wrong way, and for these parts of the session, it's best not to replicate what I'm doing on your own computer. I'll also go through editing the right way, and for these portions of the session, would invite you to please follow along and repeat what I do on your own computer. For this session, we'll be using the same software tools we used in session 1 to generate and edit image files. If you haven't already done so, you can download and install the software we will be using for the rest of this session for OS X, Windows, or Linux. We will be using the GNU Image Manipulation Program, which can be downloaded from www.gimp.org. We will also be using OpenOffice Draw which is part of the OpenOffice suite of programs that can be downloaded from www.openoffice.org. If you already have these programs installed on your computer, you should not need to install any additional software for this session. Finally, we will be working with some example files. Please download and unzip 
the session2files.zip file from www.pdonk.com. If you go to the site, click on Support, then select the Figure Preparation and Image Editing link and click on the link to download session2files.zip. In the session2files folder that should be extracted from the session2files.zip file, there is a final figure.pdf file. Let's open and take a look at this. The rest of this session will be focused on creating a PDF file like this final figure.pdf. Looking at the file, we can see that there are several different elements. There is a bitmap image of blood cells from a scanning electron microscope. There are several different vector graphic objects, including arrows, an orange DNA helix, a graphic of a sequencing machine, and a heat map. There are also text labels near the figure, and there is a text description in the lower left corner. Let's look at the blood cell bitmap image in GIMP. So here we are in the GNU image manipulation program, which is known as GIMP. For this session, as in session 1, we will be using GIMP version 2.8.10. GIMP is updated frequently, so there may be a newer version available now. In that case, please run the latest version of the software available. It should still be possible to follow along, as most of the tools and concepts that we will be covering are consistent across versions of the software. After starting GIMP for the first time, the program will take a while to load as it will index all of the font files on your computer. Once GIMP has finished loading, there may be many different windows for the program open on screen. While having multiple windows can be very helpful, for example when working with multiple monitors, to simplify things for this workshop, we'll consolidate everything into a single window. To do this, on Microsoft Windows, click the Windows menu in the center GNU Image Manipulation Program window. On an OS X machine, please make sure one of the GIMP windows is active by clicking on its title bar, then click on the Windows menu at the top of the screen. Select Single Window Mode from the Windows menu to consolidate everything into a single window. The new Single GIMP window may need to be dragged to be centered on screen, and should look like this. Whenever working with data, especially research data, it is critical to keep unaltered original copies of data files. Please copy the Session 2 files folder on your system so that we can work with duplicates of the files and avoid altering the originals. Now let's open our copy of the blood cells image. In GIMP, go to the File menu and select Open, then open the bloodcells.tif file from the copy of the Sessions 2 files folder. With the image open in GIMP, go to the image menu and select Print Size. The Set Image Print Resolution window appears. Notice that the X and Y resolution values are set to 300 pixels per inch. It is almost always the case that bitmap images will have square pixels, so essentially always these values should match. Click the pull down menu to the right of the Height and Width fields and select Inches to display the print dimensions in inches. We can see that the print size is now 6 inches wide by 7.463 inches tall. Let's change the print size so that the image will print out 5 inches wide. Click in the Width field, then use the keyboard to delete the numbers there and enter 5, then press Return on the keyboard. Notice that the height changes to 6.219 inches tall, and the DPI changes to 360 pixels per inch. Click the OK button to set the new image print size. We've now changed the print size of the image, but we have not altered the pixel data in the image in any way. This is the right way to change the print size of a bitmap image. To save the image with its new print size, go to the File menu and select Export As. Navigate to the copy of the Session 2 Files directory and in the name field enter bloodcells5inch.tiff. Then click the Export button. The Export Images TIFF window appears. As we discussed in Session 1, we'll use LZW lossless compression 
so select LZW and click the Export button. We've done everything the right way and changed the print size of the image without changing the pixel data, which is what we wanted. Referring to our list of yes-no questions, notice that we just provided a counterexample to question 2. Question 2 was, is it always the case that the image with higher DPI is better? In this case, we have two versions of the same image, so the bitmap pixel data is identical between both files, but one has a higher DPI than the other. I'm now going to perform some operations the wrong way to demonstrate issues that can arise when manipulating image data. I would suggest that you watch these next operations closely. It may be best not to reproduce these on your own computer, as we'll subsequently go through how to move image data between programs properly. I'm going to save this image as a JPEG by going to File, Export As, and entering bloodcellsjpeg.jpg as the file name, then clicking Export. In the Export Image as JPEG window, I'm going to set the quality to 99 out of 100, the subsampling to best quality, and the DCT method to floating point, then click Export. Note that what I just did distorted the image data due to JPEG's lossy compression. Now I'm going to downsample the image. I'm going to the image menu and selecting Scale Image. As mentioned, there are times when it can be helpful to downsample an image, for example, to reduce noise. In those cases, we would do this and select a high-quality downsampling method for interpolation, such as Cubic or Sync Lankzos 3. These downsampling methods use data from multiple pixels in the original image to generate each pixel in the new downsampled image, creating the best results. Lanxos 3 is typically the highest quality downsampling method in GIMP. For this demonstration, however, I'm going to select None for interpolation, which means that when I downsample the image, GIMP will simply throw away pixel data. Now I'm going to make this image only 100 pixels wide. Note that the height changed accordingly because these two values are linked. If I wanted to stretch or distort the image, I could unlink the width and height dimensions by clicking this link icon. I'll also change the DPI value to 1000 pixels per inch. Now I'll click the scale button to downsample the image to 100 pixels wide by 124 pixels tall and set the DPI for the image to 1000 DPI. Again, we generally never want to do something like this. If I use the navigation dialog to zoom in on the pixels, we can see the blocky pixel structure of the image. Now I'll upscale the image. Again, I'll go to the image menu, then select image, and I'll select cubic interpolation and set the width to 2000 pixels. Then I'll click scale. If I zoom out a bit, we can see that this has created a blurry image. I'm going to save this image as a TIFF file by going to File, Export As, and entering the name bloodcellspoorquality.tiff, then clicking the Export button. I'll use LZW Compression and click the Export button. Now I'll go to the File menu and select Close All. I'll open these files to compare them. Looking first at bloodcellsjpeg.jpg, we know that the image quality is slightly distorted from the original file because of the lossy JPEG compression we used. However, the image data still resembles the original. Opening bloodcellspoorquality.tiff, we can see that the image data are greatly distorted. Comparing these two files, we can see that these images provide examples that show the answer to the first three yes-no questions is no. The TIFF has more pixels than the JPEG and has a higher DPI, but in this case, the image data in the TIFF file less accurately represents the original image data than the image data in the JPEG. Okay, let's get back to doing things the right way and try to make that PDF figure. 
If you haven't been copying me on your own system as I make these mistakes, you should still have the undistorted blood cells image open in GIMP, which is what we want. If you've been reproducing my mistakes, you can go to the File menu and select Close All, then go to File and open bloodcells5inch.tiff. The blood cells image in the figure has been colorized for artistic effect. It has also been cropped to be circular. To colorize the image, go to the Colors menu and select Colorize. In the Colorize window that appears, set the hue to 40 and the saturation to 60, then click OK. Click the Ellipse Select tool and make sure that the tool options are as configured here, checking Fixed Aspect Ratio with a 1 to 1 Aspect Ratio to constrain the selection to be a circle. Move the mouse cursor over the image and click and drag to outline a circular selection area. Release the mouse button to set the selection area, then adjust it as necessary. Once the selection area is set, go to the Edit menu and select Copy Visible. Then go back to the Edit menu and select Paste As, then New Image. A new image tab is created in GIMP and the selected pixels are pasted in. Note that the corners of the canvas for the new image are checkerboard patterns. In addition to having color values for bitmap images, some bitmap image file types can also store transparent values. GIMP highlights areas of bitmap images that are transparent with this checkerboard pattern. Some file types, like JPEG, cannot store transparent pixel data. We'll export this bitmap as a PNG file because the PNG file type can store transparent pixel data, and it uses lossless compression to preserve the full quality of 8-bit per channel RGB pixels. Go to the File menu and select Export As. Enter the file name bloodcellscropped.png and click the Export button. Make sure the options in the Export Image as PNG window are as shown here. In particular, make sure the Save Color Values from Transparent Pixels option is checked, then click Export. OK, we're done with GIMP for this session, as all the other data we'll be using to create the image will be vector or text data. Quit GIMP, then start OpenOffice Draw. As in session 1, we will be using Apache OpenOffice 4.0.1. There may be a newer version of Apache OpenOffice available now. In that case, please use the latest version of Apache OpenOffice that is available. Most of the tools and concepts covered in this workshop should be consistent across versions of OpenOffice Draw. When first launching OpenOffice, the program may display a menu allowing you to select a text document, spreadsheet, presentation, drawing, or other file type. In this case, please select Drawing to open OpenOffice Draw. If another program in the OpenOffice Draw suite is open, start OpenOffice Draw by going to the File menu, selecting New, then selecting Drawing. On the left side of the window, the Pages pane may be open. We won't be using the Pages pane for this workshop, so move the mouse cursor over the X in the upper right corner of the Pages pane and click to close the pane. This will give us more screen real estate for the workspace. Let's start by opening the bitmap image of the cells we created in GIMP. Go to the Insert menu and select Picture, From File, then select BloodCellsCropped.png. Drag one of the corner resize handles around the image while holding the Shift key to uniformly scale the image and make it smaller. Release the mouse button to set the new size. Hover the mouse over the center of the image and click and drag with the mouse to move the image to the upper left corner of the page, then release the mouse button. The image in the figure we're trying to create is surrounded by a gray circular border. Activate the ellipse tool and zoom in and pan if necessary to closely examine the image. Move the mouse close to the image, then click and drag with the mouse while holding the shift key 
to draw a circle that is slightly larger than the bitmap image. Release the mouse button to draw the circle. Hover the mouse over the center of the circle and click and drag to move the circle so that both the circle and the image are visible. Release the mouse button. Let's change the circle shape to make a frame for the bitmap image. In properties on the right, under line, set the color to gray 7 and the width to 4.5. Then click the pull down menu that reads color under fill in the area section of properties and select none. Let's change this ring shape to a contour. With the ring selected, go to the Modify menu and select Convert to Contour. Let's align the contour frame with the bitmap image. With the ring contour still selected, hold Shift on the keyboard and click on the bitmap image. Go to Modify, Alignment, Centered. Then go to Modify, Alignment, Center. Finally, let's group these together. Go to Modify, then Group. With the group still selected, go to the Edit menu and select Copy. Open the description text by going to the File menu, then select Open, and from the copy of the Session 2 Files folder, open the text.odg file. Go to the Edit menu and select Paste to paste in the bitmap and frame. Go to the file menu and select Save As, then save the file as newfigure.odg. Let's get the other vector objects to add to this figure. Go to the file menu and select Open, then open DNA.svg. In the DNA SVG window, click on the DNA shape. Note that there is a large mask area around the DNA shape that fills the page. With this whole area selected, go to the Modify menu and select Break. Now, with just the DNA shape selected, go to the Edit menu and select Copy. Go to the File menu and select Close, then discard any changes if prompted. Return to the New Figure.odg window and go to Edit then paste. Go to the file menu and select open. Open the sequencer.svg file. Single click on the sequencer. Go to the modify menu and select break. Go to the edit menu and select copy, then go to the file menu and select close and discard changes. Return to the new figure.odg window and click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Go to Edit, then Paste. Go to the File menu and select Open. Open the heatmap.odg file. Single click on the heatmap. Go to the Edit menu and select Copy, then go to the File menu and select Close. Return to the new figure.odg window and click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Go to Edit, then Paste. Go to the File menu and select Save. Click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Zoom out and pan the workspace to see the full page. We now have most of the elements we need to complete the figure. We will go into more detail on how to create some of the other vector graphics we opened and imported in Session 3. We need to draw the arrows for the figure. Click on the down arrow to the right of the connector tool in the drawing toolbar. The connectors toolbar should appear. Click on the line at the bottom of the connectors toolbar to pop out the connectors toolbar and make it hover over the window. Click and drag on the title bar of the connectors toolbar to move it as necessary and release the mouse button to reposition it. Click the curved connector ends with arrow tool. 
Move the mouse cursor over the center of the right side of the blood cells group and notice that a broken line appears allowing us to attach the connector. Click and hold on the right center side of the box to glue the start of the connector. Then drag the mouse while holding the mouse button down over the top of the DNA shape. Release the mouse over the top center of the DNA shape to draw the connector arrow. Click again on the curved connector ends with arrow tool and connect the center right side of the DNA to the top center of the sequencer. Repeat this process to connect the center right side of the sequencer to the top center of the heat map. Go to File and select Save. Click the X on the Floating Connectors toolbar to close it. Click on the Select tool in the Drawing toolbar. The arrows that we've just drawn are different from the ones in the figure we're trying to reproduce. They're black and thinner than what we want. Click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything, then single click on the top connector. Hold down the shift key and single click on each of the other connectors to select them all. In Properties, under Line, click the pull-down menu under Width and select 4.5. Click the pull-down menu next to Color and select Gray 7. Click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. In the figure we're trying to recreate, the DNA shape is rotated clockwise slightly, implying motion. To do this, single click on the DNA shape, then single click on it again to display the rotation and shear handles. Move the mouse cursor over the upper right rotation handle and click and drag to rotate the DNA shape. Release the mouse button to set the rotation. Notice that the connector arrows align themselves properly to the new orientation of the DNA shape. Click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Click and drag on the center of the blood cells to move them so that the cells are above the description text. Notice that the connector arrow follows the blood cells. This is what we want, but notice that the start of the connector arrow is very close to the frame around the blood cells. To get a little more space around the blood cells, single click on the connector arrow between the blood cells and the DNA. Click and drag on the red connector handle attached to the blood cells, drag it away from the cells and release the mouse button to detach it from the cells. We'll create another invisible circle that will circumscribe the blood cell frame and provide a bit of spacing. Click on the ellipse tool, move the mouse cursor near the blood cells and click and drag to start drawing an ellipse. Hold the shift button and continue dragging to draw a circle that is slightly larger than the frame around the cells. Then release the mouse button. We've already placed the cell image where we want it, but we want to align this new circle with the cell group. To do this, we'll first protect the position of the cell group. Single click on the cells. Go to the format menu and select Position and Size, and in the window that appears, check to protect the position of the cell group. Then click the OK button. Clicking and dragging on the cells will not allow us to move the cells now, since the group's position is protected. With the cells selected, hold Shift and click on the circle. Go to Modify, select Alignment, then select Centered. Go again to Modify, select Alignment, then select Center. Hold Alt on the keyboard and click in the center of the circle to select the cells. 
go to Format, select Position and Size, and then uncheck Protect Position and click OK. Single click on the circumference of the larger circle shape. In Properties, set it to have no fill and no line. The larger circle shape becomes invisible. Hold Shift and single click on the cells. Release Shift. Go to the Modify menu and select Group. We've now grouped the invisible circle shape with the cell group. Now, single click on the connector arrow we disconnected. Click and drag the start of the arrow to the middle of the right side of the new cells group and notice that it attaches to the invisible outer circle in the group. To complete the figure, we just need to add labels to the figure. Click the text tool in the drawing toolbar, then click on the workspace to the right of the top connector arrow. Type Extract DNA from Blood Sample. A faint box should surround the text. Move the cursor so that it hovers over one of the edges of the box. The mouse cursor should change to a hand icon. Single click with the mouse. With the text selected in Properties, make sure that the font is set to 18 point Arial and click the arrow next to the font color, then select Gray 7 as the color. With the text still selected, go to the Edit menu and select Copy, then go to the Edit menu and select Paste. Click and drag on the border around the text and drag the copy of the text to the right of the second connector arrow from the top. Double click on the text and use the keyboard to change the text to Sequence DNA, then click in an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Go to File and select Save to save everything to newfigure.odg. This uses the Open Office Draw file type. This file type is ideal if the figure will be edited in the future, and all figures created in OpenOffice Draw should be saved in this file type. In order to share figures generated in OpenOffice Draw with other vector editing programs, it is possible to export data to a standard container file type like SVG by going to the File menu and selecting Export, then selecting the SVG file type. For publication, if the figure will not be edited in the future, it is also possible to export to the popular PDF file type. Let's do this now by going to the File menu and selecting Export as PDF. In the PDF Options window that appears, make sure that Lossless Compression is selected under Images and that the other options are as indicated here. If we wanted to encrypt data in the PDF, or set other protection options for the file, we could click on Security and set more options here. We don't need these options now, so click the Export button. Save the file as newfigure.pdf. Close OpenOffice Draw and open the newfigure.pdf file in a PDF reader on your computer. If you do not have a PDF reader, Download and install the free Adobe Acrobat Reader and use that to open the file. Looking closely at the PDF file, we can see that the vector objects are preserved as vectors and appear smooth regardless of how much we zoom in. We can also see that text is searchable, which is what we want. If we consider the heat map in particular, zooming in reveals all the heat map data without distortion. This heat map is just a manufactured example, but looking at it,
consider that the samples in the upper left quadrant are clearly distinct in some way from the samples in the other three quadrants of the heat map. Imagine that we wanted to include this heat map in a figure to make this simple point that the samples in the upper left quadrant are different in some way from the rest of the samples. Even with a poor quality bitmap representation of the heat map, this difference might be obvious. However, by including the heat map as a vector, all of the data in the heat map are clearly visible to the viewer if he or she should want to look at them. It is always best to preserve data in its native format, whether it is text, vector, or bitmap image data. When exporting graphs, heat maps, or other figures from other software, use a vector file type like SVG. We've used the proper workflow and created this PDF file the way we want. I'm going to go through one final process the wrong way to illustrate what can happen if we had not used the proper workflow when creating the figure. I'll go back to the new figure.odg file in OpenOffice Draw and go to File, Export, then select JPEG, name the figure new figure JPEG.jpg, and click Save. I'll set the DPI to 300 pixels per inch, set the width to 8.5 inches, and the height to 11 inches, then set the quality to 100 and export it. Note that this is the wrong way to export these data. I'll then close the file and go to File, Open, and open the new figure jpeg.jpg file I just created. If we zoom in, we can see that the text is legible, but has been rasterized as a bitmap, which is not ideal. The shapes in the figure have also been rasterized as bitmaps, which is not good. I'll now export this as a PDF with really destructive bitmap compression options. I'll go to the File menu and select Export as PDF. I'll use JPEG compression at 30% and change to 75 dpi, then save this as bad quality PDF. If we look at this version in a PDF viewer, we can see that it is badly distorted. It's still possible to see the heat map, but we cannot discern the individual data points as with the PDF we generated properly. The text is also very difficult to read. The text is also not searchable. Comparing this PDF file with the JPEG I created a few moments ago, we can see that the answer to our final yes-no question is no. In this case, the JPEG file has sharper text than the PDF. Using the proper workflow, however, should always generate sharper text in a PDF than in a JPEG. With that, we'll wrap up session two. For more information, including sessions one and three of this workshop, please visit www.pdonk.com. Go to the support section and go to the figure preparation and image editing workshop link. I want to thank my colleague Jonathan Huppy for all of his help and thank you very much for watching. I'm Curtis Glavin from the Pediatric Oncology Department at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute.